stages through the whole thing, too preliminary, and it can be broken up into such, such fine language and distinctions that they are equally stages leading to enlightenment. And the ninth one, each one, uh, four of them, major ones, uh, are showing man relating and trying to control, catch, catch a sight of, finally control and ride the ox, which is getting to know oneself on higher and higher levels. But the eighth, there is no ox and no man, there's just a circle. And the lines, the commentary, talks about the brilliance of that. And that's, of course, the most brilliant light of being. Therefore, sometimes this is called uh, the most brilliant light of being. It's also called luminosity, the experience of luminosity, divine radiance. And, and this whole allegory of the cave, you see, the whole allegory of the cave is to underscore several things, but one of the most essential things it's trying to underscore is the need to get a glimpse of this. To get a glimpse of that so you can go beyond it. I have to go beyond it, sir. And that's the good itself. See, the word to behold the good, idea of the good, is to behold the good. Therefore, it's an object of contemplation. And therefore, it has this impact. Which is why he calls it the most brilliant light of being. Now, there's a, several great lines in here that one of the most difficult things to deal with uh, when you're dealing with the allegory is where he's making the distinction between the idea of the good and the good itself. And you have to be a very careful reader to see the, how he's making that distinction. And uh, it's very, very well done, very compact, very precise. So, uh, I, I, I hope I answered your question. Into the state of knowing. That's right. Yeah. The knowing beyond knowing. <laughs> That's right, because the good is not an object of knowledge. That's right. But this can be, the idea of the good can be, since that can be known. So that's the last of all things to be known, it says in the allegory of the cave. It's the last thing of all, the sun itself. Then you reason about it and discover, hey, there's a cause behind all of this. So that's outside of experience. You're led by reflection and reading to go beyond that experience because he's leading you to the good itself. So in the cave, allegory of the cave in the upper world, there is something that is necessarily beyond it and that's the good itself. Sometimes called the one. I know, a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people do, yeah, yeah. Now if he's a metaphysician, he's right. If he's a normal person, he's wrong. Because the good is not the good. The good is not an object, and in that sense, it, it can't be related to as an object. If he's a metaphysician, he's right. If he means it in the popular sense, he's foolish. Yeah, well, he was a philosopher. You know, I think he was a Platonist at the University of Washington. Well, let's hope he was a metaphysician as well. Anyway, he just that. Oh, okay. Just to make sure. Uh, the it's, it's a very important point. I'm very glad you brought it up. Look, uh, this, you see, the, di the goal of the dialectic in Plato's Republic is you then must turn on this experience. You must turn on this experience itself and apply the dialectic. Because in that experience, you are going to make certain implicit uh, claims about the very nature of, the, of what it is you experience. And the most interesting one you're going to make, regardless of what tradition you're in, is that you have finally reached what is, at the capital I. You finally have reached what is reality, ultimate reality. And the goal of the dialectic is to examine that, to see the assumptions upon which that is made, what hypothesis a person is assuming when they make that claim, and to be able to uh, explore it in such a way that the person can see that those hypotheses must be rejected as he proceeds to the dialectic. Demolishing the hypothesis as it proceeds is the way he discusses it. So that one undermines the very experience in order to transcend it. 
And that's where the allegory of the cave finally goes, outside of the allegory of the cave in the upper world. Do we experience something real and we have to undermine it to go to the next step? We have to, we have to uh, refuse what we've learned in order to go beyond the next step. Yes, and since this is the highest object of knowing, <coughs> this is the last one you pull it on. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, if you want, um, uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, like, here, let me, give you a, let, me, let me give you a quote on this whole thing. He's talking about these studies, the earlier studies, and he says, uh, oh, the f and the few which do take hold of truth a little, as we said, like geometry, and those which go with it, we see they, they're in a dreamland about real being. And to perceive with a waking vision is impossible for these arts, so long as they leave untouched the hypotheses which they use and cannot give any account of them. For when a beginning is something a man does not know, and the middle and the end are woven of what he does not know, how can such a mere admission ever amount to knowledge? Then the dialectical method, the dialectic method, proceeds along by this way, demolishing the hypothesis as it goes, back to the very beginning itself, in order to find firm ground. The soul's eye, which is really buried in a sort of barbaric bog, it draws out quietly and leads upwards, having the arts we described as handmaidens, helpers. And these have often been termed sciences from habit, but we need another name. One clearer than opinion, dimmer than science, understanding. So this is the dialectic, therefore uses the understanding as the particular way of contemplating, it's a rational, see it's a rational, intelligible contemplation that breaks through this into that about which you cannot say. Uh, Buddha gives the idea, he says, the others can do it. You get across the other side, you don't need to do anymore. No. <laughs> no. 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 So then, uh, just to pull this together in a little more ordered form. Now, he now wants to turn to give the final dialectical exercise. And now, what he's done with the allegory now, if, if you can still maintain some clarity with my figure superimposed on other figures, is that each one of these can be said to represent a certain phase in the parable, in the allegory. We could even make it clearer, just to make sure. All right, look here. This is what we're doing. I'm going to put the fire here. I'm going to put the wall of the cave here. Therefore, this is image thinking and that sense of loyalty to the physical universe, which we often are urged to have in our society. Right? The fire, the source of the images being carried by the men walking along this wall. Right? That's belief. When he gets into the upper world, that's understanding. 